The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Canada promised to plant 2 billion trees by 2031 to tackle climate change and support biodiversity. Tonight, we'll examine whether the policy has taken root and whether that target is realistic. Then, from the divorce appeal region to what kind of education new police recruits should get, we've got the Agendas Week in Review. It's Friday, May 19th, and that's ahead on the Agenda. It was a novel election promise. Vote for us and we'll plant two billion, billion with a B, trees to help fight climate change. And indeed, once in office, the federal liberals made it a real policy objective, saying they would get the task done by 2031. So, as warnings about rising global temperatures hit new highs and wildfires consume a half million hectares out west, let's find out how it's going so far with Jessica Kaknavicius, CEO of Forest Ontario, which is a not-for-profit tree planting and forest stewardship organization that's partnered with the federal government for the Two Billion Trees program. Eric Davies, forest ecologist at the University of Toronto, Brent Forbes, nursery manager at Somerville Seedlings in Alliston, Ontario, which is providing many saplings for the initiative. And Janet Sumner, executive director of the conservation organization Wildlands League. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Before we start our conversation, I just wanted to go over the details of this plan, uh, Trudeau's 10-year tree planting promise. During the 2019 federal election campaign, the Liberals promised to plant 2 billion trees from 2021 to 2031. They believe it will cost $3.2 billion. The planted trees would cover an area roughly twice the size of PEI, 1.1 million hectares. Canada's Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development recently audited the federal government's plans and revealed they weren't even on track to get 4% of the promised trees in the ground by the end of 2030. While the government appears to have nearly met its 2021 goals, he estimated that in 2022, only 16.5 million trees were planted. That's 43.5 million below what the government had hoped. He found that during the first year of planting, the government did not set any clear expectations for monitoring the health and survival of the planted trees. Initially, the government said the program would eliminate up to two megatons of CO2 emissions annually by 2030. But the audit revealed it's not going to start reducing emissions and would instead be adding to them until 2031, and that's because due to the process of planting, etc. He concluded that, quote, it is unlikely that the program will meet its objectives unless significant changes are made. Eric, I wanted to start with you. Um, what have these startling numbers revealed about the tree planting system in this country? Well, to me, uh, it, it kind of just echoes the other audits that have come out globally. There, there's one last week in Australia. There's a number out of the US and the UK showing that um, when you try to ramp up tree planting to really high numbers, you often get really high mortality. Or you, you're forced to use low quality stock, plant them specific times. And uh, there's a, a new book out uh, from Fred Pierce called One Trillion Trees. It's a global review of tree planting projects and it shows that a lot of them are not working when they're forced and <clears throat> natural forest regeneration is uh, as or more powerful. So it, in a general, yeah, in a general sense, I think it is a, just a, um, a similar audit to It's a wake-up call, it's, you say? I, I, I think so, yeah. And when you say high mortality, you mean the trees die? Trees die, yeah. Sometimes, you know, there, there was a large one in Turkey a few years ago. They planted 11 million trees and 90% were dead within three months. Mm -hmm. But on a smaller scale, when you, when you're, when you have the time to, to grow trees properly, plant them, and then steward them, I think that's, you know, one thing you mentioned, there's not a lot of money for monitoring and stewardship. Mm -hmm. So if you can add that, then you can get successful tree planting. Um, yeah. Jessica, did the federal government underestimate how much time and how much work planting two billion trees would be? 
Yeah, I think that people have to realize that it takes time to grow trees. So everything from seed to tree to in the ground to ensuring that they grow into healthy forests, that takes time. And so doing a review one year after a program is launched is hard because we're all trying to ramp up capacity. And so working with organizations like ours, Forest Ontario, and through our national planting program, Forest Recovery Canada, mm -hmm. we really focus on ensuring those trees survive by working with amazing partners, by working with nurseries. And so we have over 83% survival rate on our, tr our trees that are getting planted. So again, it's that concept of time. And for a lot of us in this sector, we don't think two, three years ahead. We're thinking decades ahead. How do these trees turn into really healthy <clears throat> forests? And for us, we need to think of this program like that. How are we investing today to ensure that these trees that are being planted are going to be healthy forests in the future? And Janet, Eric mentioned that, you know, um, some of these trees are just, they're dying. Um, what else do you, do you attribute the delay to? Well, I always expected the delay. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because it takes, to Jessica's point, it takes three to five years to actually grow the trees, to get the saplings, to plant them in the ground. So that was fully expected in my, my view, or it should have been. And it also takes time to get the provinces on board. And the provinces have promised, or the federal government designed the program so that the provinces would be delivering, provinces and territories would be delivering over 60% of it. And those agreements have not been forthcoming. At the time of the audit, none had been signed. So we've got one signed now with British Columbia, but we've seen a delay, mm -hmm. and that's because provinces are lumping everything into it, whether it's a conservation agreement on nature, the promise around 30 by 30, caribou conservation. And when you do that, it creates delays in the system and getting those agreements signed. So the, Why aren't the provinces signing? Well, because they're, they're trying to negotiate everything and, and the kitchen sink all at the same time. Mm. And so this is taking a, a delay on this and getting it in, and they've got other demands, et cetera. And they didn't sign up for the, the $2 billion tree program to start with, it was a federal government promise. Do you think that the federal government should have foreseen this happening? I'm not sure. They were looking for dance partners, and I think that they could have actually had a, a broader look at who the dance partners could be. Mm -hmm. But when they designed the program, they said, oh, our partners are going to be provinces and territories. They'll want to do that. If you look at Ontario, they actually cancelled a tree planting program here when they got elected. So I would actually say that provinces aren't the only entity. We should be looking at municipalities. We should be looking at being more directional as well in terms of how we do our tree planting. Brent, uh, two billion trees, that's a lot. I'm planted in 10 years. Was this a lofty goal to begin with? It, it is a lofty goal, but it's an ambitious goal. And uh, those are the type of programs that we need. Uh, when we're talking about all the benefits of planting trees. Uh, we want to see numbers like that. Uh, so I think that there you know, should be some credit given to the size of the program and, and the scale. Um, you know, to my knowledge, this is the first national tree planting program that Canada wide uh, and covers all of the diversity uh, we find across Canada. So from the unique ecosystems here in Southern Ontario, all the way to, um, to BC, which is a very different system. Uh, so I think uh, as others have said, there needs to be uh, time to scale that up, to get the program running, to to uh, start to grow the trees, and uh, and uh, communicating with the nurseries and the other partners to get them in the ground. Um, you said it was an ambitious goal, mm -hmm. uh, but even if you say one billion trees in ten years, that sounds incredible. So why two billion? Why that number? Uh, I can't speak. Uh, maybe uh, someone else can speak to the to the exact uh, reason for the two billion. Um, but um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a reflection of, of what we need to do to, to combat climate change and to to get more trees in the ground. Canada Canada wide has uh, has an immense um, tree planting program um, all across the country uh, in areas that uh, uh, have been uh, harvested for, for forestry, uh, reforestation, and then here in southern Ontario when we talk about afforestation, so reclaiming uh, those areas that were once forested. Because um, I'm just trying to think that if, um, yes, it's a, a great goal, but if it's a, a number that's ambitious and we can't achieve, then what's the point of saying two billion trees? Eric? Um, well, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when this was announced, the $2 billion tree program, everyone I ever knew called me and said, Eric, you know, finally, we've got this national program. And so I think, I think it, you know, it should be celebrated that we're trying to uh, uh, get our goals high because climate change is a big goal, biodiversity change is a big goal, and uh, human health, which is the other kind of mm -hmm. third goal. So we need to do it. I mean, I think um, 
More important than planting trees, though, is the stewardship of the ecosystems that already exist across Canada. I mean, so the if, number itself is not what we should be focusing on? Yeah, it should be more the health of the forest. We should look at, instead of two million trees, it should be like a million hectares of Canada's forest should be restored mm -hmm. in urban and rural areas, stuff like that. Uh, do you think the two billion trees program is planting the right type of trees? No, that, that's a big problem, actually. Like, if the three main goals of the two billion tree program are carbon capture, biodiversity enhancement and human well-being. And I think that all three of those are better achieved through stewardship. And like one thing with the Two Billion Tree Program is if you look at the species they're recommending to plant, mm -hmm. almost half of them are non-native, including invasive species like the Norway maple. So if we're planting non-native invasive species across Canada, we're gonna end up with dysfunctional forest ecosystems that are not functioning as ecosystems and not providing carbon capture biodiversity or human health benefits. And I would say too that I think it's really important that you work with partners that are focusing on the right tree in the right place. And so mm -hmm. what we mean by that is looking at what's right for the ecosystem, what is gonna survive, what is actually gonna turn into a healthy forest, and then working with seed collectors, working with nursery partners to grow the right species. So that really comes down to finding the right partners that are committed to that as an organization to mm -hmm. ensure that those trees survive. Well, <laughs> sorry, uh, well, yeah, I think to, to echo what, what Jess said, that, that's one of the most important elements of this program is that we're, we're simply not growing trees and, and seeing them go out the door and, and that's the end of it. These are planted and planned by professionals uh, with the correct species for the correct site and, uh, and then the tending that we talked about earlier is a critical component of that to mm -hmm. see those trees survive for, for future years. Yeah, I, I would also, uh, just to follow up on what Eric was saying, this is not a program in isolation either. Canada has a commitment to protect 30% of the country by 2030. Mm -hmm. So having that program go well and this program, and they're both designed to help us um, halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. So this is not just a climate change program. Mm -hmm. It's also about achieving goals for nature. And that's, uh, and when you talk about 2 billion being a big number, yes, it's a big number but when you say it's the size of PEI think about how much land we actually do need to restore in this country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we need an ambitious goal we need to get out there we especially in the urban and near urban areas places like London Ontario have a tree canopy goal of over 40 percent looking at Toronto who wants to plant 55 million trees actually going with those dance partners and saying how can we help how can we get this going and Eric. I think, like, just to add, like, the fact that we have a lofty goal is, the fa is it's, pr it's positive to think that we're having these conversations. Like, for us to be going, we need to plant more trees. We're further ahead than we were 10 years ago because society as a whole is promoting this. Government's really advocating for it. So globally, there's a need and there's a recognized um, participation in increasing forest cover, restoration efforts. And so the fact that we're having a conversation like that is really exciting. Mm. Eric, would you say that the Two Billion Trees program has been driven by science? No, I think that's actually one of the, the biggest issues. When uh, I participated at 3 UAT Forestry on all the, the, the information sessions, and um, I was surprised when they took the stock of who's in it, scientists were the least represented group at 3%. So Was that surprising to you? It, it was, was to well, because I, th I think really everything should be science-driven, evidence-based policy, right? Yeah. And, um, and I, I think it's that working with, you know, at the same time, scientists can get go too fast and get too ambitious like they did with the Trillion Tree Program. That came out of some, you know, scientific papers that were overly ambitious. And so you need to temper that with groups like Forest Ontario, Somerville, who have the experience to know how to get it done. But more science-driven planting, and this is where the ecosystem restoration gets in, um, linking with Canada's other objectives like conserving Canada's forest land and, and restoring the health of it. Janet, you're nodding? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We need to be science-based decision-making. And I think that's why you need to go to the experts. Canada can't be the tree planting experts. They need to rely on those experts, Trees Canada, Forest Ontario, finding places that they can go and work with. There's lots of experts, expertise in the city of Toronto, other municipalities across this country. And that's why I say that I think to broaden the dance partners would actually be really helpful and looking at them as the way, as a delivery mechanism for those two billion trees and not just uh, 
waiting for proposals to come in. And that's one of my major mm -hmm. criticisms of this. I think it's been far too proposal driven and they could actually be more proactive in driving the trees to the places we need them. Well, the uh, so far, the majority of the trees that have been planted have been planted in Quebec, BC and Alberta. But there's also a fair amount being planted in this province in Ontario. Uh, Jessica, you have teamed up with the federal government for the work in this province. How many trees has your organization planted in Ontario as part of the program? So we're working on a commitment to work with the federal government to, government to plant over 30 million trees over the next 10 years and that's working with partners but when you think of like what's being promised across the actual program mm -hmm. 65 percent of that is going towards provincial and territorial governments and 25 percent is going towards private land across Canada so we work with mostly with private landowners in Ontario to help them establish forest cover so that also takes time so we get back to you know why is it delayed we have to work with individual landowners to find places to plant trees then find the seeds and the trees to get them in the ground, work with our nursery partners to grow the trees. So it does take time and investment, but yeah. um, we're excited about the opportunity to contribute to the program and look for ways to scale it across Canada. Uh, you mentioned it was 30 million over 10 years and your, your plant, your, some of your partners are private. Um, mm -hmm. Who else is planting these trees? There's a lot of other nonprofit organizations as well as private companies that are planting lands, including Indigenous organizations and communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's interesting about the program, it's a cost share program. So government is contributing but then organizations like ours, Forest Ontario, we also have to find corporate support to, to contribute towards the program. So again, that takes time, finding ways to find fundraising and really promote the encouragement of investment in this program. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we're really on the hook to be able to bring in that additional support to be able to plant the trees. And we've been doing it for over 20 years in Ontario, and we're excited about doing more of it across Canada. Are you using volunteers or professionals? We use professionals for the large scale planting. We do have other programs that are not part of the Two Billion Tree Program where we work with volunteers. It's so important for people to find that connection Mm -hmm. So that volunteer piece is really valuable for people understanding and benefiting from trees. Mm -hmm. But in the end, mm -hmm. it's not going to be come down to volunteers planting two billion trees. It's really professionals, and that's what's needed to get to Eric's yeah. point to grow healthy trees. But mm -hmm. the volunteers aspect also creates that kind of like ownership. Like this is part definitely yeah. and that stewardship and yeah. that connection. It's yeah. critical, but it's not going to be the way we achieve the target. Mm -hmm. Brent, where are these trees being planted? Uh, well, obviously they're, they're Canada wide, but but here specifically on in Ontario, um, as as Jess alluded to, it's it's uh, largely on private land and uh, with working with private landowners and uh, reforesting areas, so afforestation on uh, former farmlands and uh, properties that people are looking to convert back to forest, which in southern Ontario, central eastern Ontario, is an incredibly valuable component. Mm -hmm. We have lost so much forest cover over the last um, century and to see that reestablished for all the benefits that the trees provide mm -hmm. is, is absolutely critical. So uh, our number here in southern Ontario um, may be smaller in terms of the overall program, mm -hmm. but it's one of the most uh, uh, unique parts of, of forest cover in, in Canada and, and is absolutely critical that we continue to plant. Why is it unique? Well, the, the ecosystem is, is, uh, is not found in other parts of the, uh, of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a wide diversity of tree species and, uh, and uh, the flora and fauna that go along with that. Uh, so to see that forest cover increase and, and uh, benefit all those things is, is critical. Uh, Janet, a handful of provinces and territories have signed agreements with the federal government for the Two Billion Tree Program. Has the has Ontario government signed an agreement? Not to my knowledge. And uh, what, <laughs> what you were just saying there is, uh, is quite true about Ontario. We've got a very damaged ecosystem. If you look at Canada wide, we have about 500 species that are at risk and, f and 200 of those are in southern Ontario and we've got the least amount of land protected and the highest pressure from development. So finding ways to actually restore that landscape, places like Windsor have annual flooding events, finding ways to actually restore the ecosystems that can provide that climate resilience and help species at the same time mm -hmm. is an absolute must. So I would really encourage Ontario to get that agreement done and start the tree planting because doing private land is great, mm -hmm. but we need Ontario to actually really step up and start to engage in this program. Do you see this uh, program being successful if the government of Ontario doesn't sign on? 
I, I mean, if all the other provinces sign on, it could totally be su successful, but it will be a failure for these ecosystems because this program is not just about the two billion trees. It's about restoring nature, achieving that target of halting and reversing biodiversity loss and helping on climate change. Mm -hmm. So if Ontario chooses not to participate, that will be unfortunate and be damaging for these ecosystems, but they, they may achieve their two billion target they won't have achieved their target about halting and reversing biodiversity loss. So. Uh, Eric, you've said the program should be focused on natural regeneration yep. instead of <clears throat> artificial regeneration. Yep. Um, can you help us understand the difference between those terms? Yes, yeah, so it's uh, um, in, in forest, if you go into a forest ecosystem, they continue through the process of natural regeneration where trees, trees make seeds, seeds fall to the ground and they grow. If you go across Ontario, especially in urban and rural areas, natural re regeneration has largely, uh, it's greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but the power of natural regeneration is huge. You, you, we, billions and billions, hundreds of billions of trees naturally regenerate every year. If you go into the Toronto Ravines, for example, that's 27,000 acres of high quality forest accessible to 5 million people. And you're, you'd be hard pressed to find an acre of that that is healthy. Yeah. It's invaded with non-native tree species. There's very low natural regeneration. So we should really be focusing on going around to the already existing forests and our parks and uh, hedgerows of farm fields. Everywhere you go, they're full yeah. of invasive species. All these conservation groups that are getting land, the amazing stewardship groups, they need more funding to go in there, remove invasive species, get volunteers in and help that natural regenerative process happen. How is that different from this program? Uh, well, tree planting is what they call artificial regeneration, and it's it's very important. Sometimes it's the most important because it's the most technical. I mean, you look at the work that they do at Somerville. Brett's one of the best tree growers in Ontario, and the, uh, you know, you, Janet mentioned species at risk. There's lots of species. Uh, most of the native tree species in Ontario are declining everywhere. We should be, I think, tree planting should be focused on getting high quality local native trees into the ground to subsidize natural regeneration. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica, is that possible? What do you think of Eric's idea? Yeah, like I agree that there needs to be a balance of natural regeneration. And also what I'm hearing is like focusing on what's there and making it healthy and yeah. improving the quality of forests mm -hmm. and, and growing that into healthy forest landscapes. But in addition to that is finding ways to, to help speed up the process in spots where it's gonna take a lot more effort to bring back forests. Degraded farmland isn't gonna naturally regenerate in the time frame that we need or really might not regenerate with the species that we need so that not, that artificial regeneration or the tree planting is important to speed up the process especially if we're looking at these forests contributing to that climate change impact in the long term it helps to do the tree planting to speed up that process uh, Brent Eric said you're uh, one of the best in the <laughs> province uh, if we don't really understand how this works um, how does this work yeah it's a it's a complex process and uh, you know, one of the challenges with the program is when growing trees is uh, is the time frame that it takes. Uh, yeah. In a lot of cases, um, you know, here in Ontario, three years is, is probably the average to grow a, a tree that's suitable for planting out. Uh, so from seed to sapling? From that... from seed to, to sapling to, to shipping out. And, and that wouldn't include, um, you know, seed, important elements like seed collection or infrastructure, you know, related to planting trees. So it's, it's a lengthy process um, involved with that but one of the unique things about Ontario um, you know to some of the previous points here is the infrastructure that we have built up over the last 20 years uh, in large part to, to partner organizations like Forest Ontario and all of the agencies that do plant trees in Ontario mm -hmm. that uh, it's not just the tree it's it's seed collection and it's getting the tree in the ground and it's tending the trees on these complex sites uh, that have different requirements, the diversity of species that we grow. Uh, so it's really an impressive infrastructure to, to get trees in the ground and see them succeed. Um, but, uh, but overall, it can be a lengthy process, and that's one of the important things that we want to discuss with this, is how long it takes to actually grow a tree. Um, and I'm guessing, too, from um, your answer, that this is not just something you do, this is something that you care very much about. Um, why do you think it's important for people to understand what it takes to actually get these trees into the ground? Well, I, 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 yeah, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about it and, and growing trees. I've been doing it for, for almost 10 years now. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rewarding to think back. I was 
looking at it the other day about how many millions of trees we produce about uh, three million trees annually at our nursery wow. and uh, our business has been doing it for over over 70 years here in Ontario and uh, it's rewarding to think that all those trees are going on to the landscape and um, creating all those benefits that we want to see. And I think it's important for people to see that. I, I think that uh, one, of, one of the things that we always see when we talk to other people is nobody realizes how, how long it takes to grow a tree, how much work goes into growing a tree, the labor and seed collection and all of those things. So I think it's great to, to have that out there and have people see it. Uh, so the trees that you plant now, would they then be ready in 2026? In 2026, so yeah, it, it's an interesting point. Um, so uh, with the kind of the rollout of, of the two billion program, one of the things that our nursery went ahead and did and some of the other nurseries in Ontario, we have an existing infrastructure. Trees are being planted now under other planting programs. And it was really important that we didn't see a gap in that, that we can't miss a year that ha risk some of that infrastructure falling apart. So we went ahead and seeded uh, inventory and planted and transplanted inventory for 24 and 25 and 26 trees that at the time didn't have a home and we're doing the same thing now for future years so yesterday we were seeding white pine those trees are available in the spring of 2026 and we want to see them go on the ground here in Ontario. Oh my gosh the amount of planning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Eric are you uh, confident Canada's tree nurseries have the capacity to grow the two billion trees we wanted planted by 2031? Um, I, I, I don't know, because that's really... But what I do know is that they have the capacity to grow good trees. I think what one thing that's lacking right now is uh, supply of native tree seeds. So one thing at University of Toronto Forestry for the past decade, we started a, a long-term research project mapping out old-growth native trees across Ontario, largely in Toronto, and studying the biology of tree seed production. Uh, and we've, we've learned a lot because one of the things, again, uh, Somerville was actually an early partner about 10 years ago. And we were giving, you know, uh, some of these seeds of the local old growth trees to nurseries that can start growing local, uh, local native species. And, and again, it's really hard to get that. So that's something I think if we can, we can help the tree nursery industry, scientists can, ecologists can, everything yeah. from helping provide local, local seeds and, and then even locally planting those trees in a great way, giving them the follow, follow up stewardship they need. Does anybody here think that we can meet that target by 2031? So I, I think one of the things that Eric was just mentioning is actually really important is that we always expected that lag. There was always going to be a lag because you needed to start planting them. But I applaud Somerville because if they've already been proactive about this, mm. that's really great. What needed to happen though was we actually needed to start funding the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And what we did instead was the program was designed to say, well, let's fund the demand side and then that will actually increase the supply. And I think we needed to do both at the same time if we actually wanted to meet that target. And we're not going to meet the target unless provinces start to step up because they're 65% of the challenge here. So we really need provinces to come on board. And if they do and we can accelerate this, then we might have a chance. But again, the two billion is not the point. The two billion is how to achieve your halt and reverse and how to get to your climate change goals. Mm -hmm. I, I, think that, I think that's a great point. And, and, uh, I think I can't speak for other nurseries, but certainly our nursery and some of the, the other nurseries that we work closely with here in Ontario have the capacity to grow more trees. And I would say that's echoed Canada wide. We, we have uh, nationwide, there's a massive tree planting effort. Uh, there's there's uh, growers and, and, and greenhouses all over the country uh, growing lots of stock. Uh, so simply being given the commitment to that once they grow those trees that mm -hmm. they're going to go out the door and they're going to end up in the ground is really what they need long-term kind of sustainable yeah. commitments to grow trees yeah. is the way that it's going to happen um eric mentioned before that there's a lot of uh planting initiatives around the world jessica can you help us understand how does how does planting two billion trees actually combat climate change? Yeah, so one thing we have to realize is that if we want to actually contribute to solutions for climate change, forests have to be a part of the solution. Yeah. And so for, for Canada, we signed up to reduce our emissions between 40 to 45 percent lower than 2005 targets or 2005 emissions. So what that means is we have to look at forests as a solution for us to reduce in addition to other things like focusing on manufacturing and reducing emission output. And so forests, as they're growing, sequester carbon 
carbon. As they get bigger, they continue to sequester carbon. So the, these trees right now will take a couple of years for it to even show in any type of register that we're actually reducing carbon. So it's really that long-term, like you said, long-term agreements, but also long-term expectations that these trees are going to sequester carbon, but it's going to take a long time for us to see those results and for us to be committed to that, to seeing that and to say, you know, maybe it's going to be 2050 before we see it. But imagine the tree, if we don't plant the trees today, we won't see the, the solutions for tomorrow. So doing something today is better than not doing anything at all. Uh, you mentioned the year 2050. So we know from the commissioner's report that these trees will not be reducing CO2 emissions until 2031. The federal government had been relying on the 2 billion trees to reach their goal of a 40% cut in carbon emissions by 2030. Um, do you think they'll now have to change that goal? Janet? For, for me, yes, I think that the, the commitment to see them achieve these goals through the tree planting um, and, and finding a way to sort of count the carbon that they're going to absorb is one aspect of it. But the other aspect is the cooling effect that they provide in municipalities. When you have a tree canopy cover that's 40% of your municipality, all of a sudden your uh, costs and your emissions for doing air conditioning start to become reduced. So I think that we need to look beyond just what trees can do in terms of how much carbon dioxide they can suck up, but what are they doing in terms of the overall ecosystem and the benefits that they're providing. It also provides climate resilience as well. So I think that this is, um, there are a number of factors with the trees, but I would say you're right, that it's going to be tough to hit that target right now. Mm -hmm. If we start to engage the provinces and we can put a jet pack on this, we could maybe, we could maybe get there. Eric? Um, you know, again, I think, I think we need a, a paradigm shift away from tree planting to forest restoration. I, I think tree planting is a great thing. We need it, but not here or Australia or anywhere are we going to achieve any of these objectives, not carbon capture, biodiversity enhancement, or human well-being from planting mm. billions of trees because they're, they're dying like everywhere. You know, large-scale tree planting projects end up in large-scale tree planting mortality. And what we need is we need ecosystems because ecosystems, like... This, the carbon sequestration of a tree is one small fraction of what yeah. an ecosystem can do, like the soil in Absolutely. a forest. They're discovering can sequester as much as trees. And if you think about biodiversity, they don't live in straight rows of tree plantations. And no. human health and well-being, I have just a paper, a global meta-analysis came out a couple of weeks ago with now 832 studies showing how, how people benefit from mm -hmm. engaging with nature. So I think if we're in a race and if we want to achieve these goals, we're going to get bigger bang for the buck by local stewardship with, with farmers and hedgerows and urban parks. So, And I would say too, like I don't want to discount yeah. tree planting. I don't want to say that it's not a solution or we shouldn't do it. I do think it is a solution. It's part of a solution. There's a lot of things we can do to reduce our carbon emissions or increase sequestration. But I also want to point out that not all the trees are dying. Like we're working really hard with a lot of partners to ensure the trees do survive into mm -hmm. healthy forests. So I want people to know that programs, is when you work with the right partners, we are trying to make sure trees grow into healthy forests. That's not, uh, not an un, like the right partners will focus on that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've got, well, I've just got one minute left and I want to give it to uh, Brent. Oh. Um, what if the federal government decides that we're not going to meet our goal and decides to scale back on the amount of trees? What happens to the trees that you have in your nursery? Uh, well, I mean, certainly if the trees d didn't have a home, I mean, we, we, we couldn't uh, continue with the growing process. But I think we're, as we stand right now that, that uh, we expect the, the stock that we're growing to, to go into the ground. And we have a, you know, Ontario, as I said earlier, is, it has a unique system. It's a, a robust tree planting system. And uh, we expect the partners to continue to plant those. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to the coming years. Okay, and Eric, I'll give you the last 30 seconds. Well, I would, I think maybe just, I think echo what you all said is that it's, it's an exciting time to be in tree planting, forest restoration, all of this stuff. And, and, and somehow, like this panel discussion shows, it's bringing in all these elements together and uh, in a, in a complimentary way. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we're heading into a long weekend and the thing that I want to do the most is go <laughs> to a park and just lay yeah. uh, underneath a tree and enjoy being outside. So um, yeah. thank you so much for helping us understand this issue. We really appreciate your time thank and you, you all driving into the studio. <laughs> thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.
The agenda this week debated new provincial policy for police education and learned why critics worry that Mexican democracy might be slipping. The agenda's weekend review begins with a hotly contested breakup of Peel Region. Have a look. Just so I'm clear, you you like the region of Peel. I mean, you, you tinker, but it's okay. You like it the way it is. You want a divorce. You want a divorce as well? Brampton wants out too? So what our position has been, if, if Mississauga insists on a divorce, um, then they have to pay the bill. And what the bill is, is our servicing capacity is already at capacity. We've had four housing projects turned down because of a lack of servicing just in recent weeks. To rebuild that servicing capacity is extraordinarily expensive. And so when we built it 50 years ago, you know, the cost of infrastructure was very different. And Mississauga has used up that servicing capacity. There is no vacant land in Mississauga. They've used it up. And now it was the time for Mississauga to pay for new servicing capacity, a new police uh, facility in Brampton, new servicing capacity in Caledon. And just when they're on the hook to pay for this, they're saying, we're going to leave. Good news, the Premier has assured me Mississauga will not be able to run away on their bill. What's the bill, do you think? Well, how much? To rebuild, to have servicing capacity. Calm down, Alvin. Um, I will get to you in a second. <laughs> according yeah. to the consultants that the city of Brampton is engaged, uh, the water capacity, the, wa the water treatment would be a billion. The wastewater would be three billion. It'd be four billion, um, ju just for Brampton alone. That's not including Caledon. Um, historically, we've paid a 40% share of the cost of new infrastructure. We paid a 40% cost for the two facilities in Mississauga. And the expectation is that Mississauga was going to pay for their share in Brampton. Um, we're talking about, this is a huge, you know. Multiple billions of dollars. And you want him to write a check for that? Well, legally, they're obligated to. Okay, let's find out uh, over here. Do you think you owe them some money? So I don't dispute uh, Mayor Brown's numbers at all. I mean, absolutely, the, the city of Brampton has contributed 40% of all regional infrastructure for the last 50 years. But conversely, Mississauga has contributed 60% uh, and has paid the, the freight for the region appeal for the last 50 years as well, mm. right? So, you know, we can, we can go into a negotiation and understand that there are services that support everybody and that we are going to continue to use those services and we can have cost share agreements. We already do this with York Region, but where we provide them water and wastewater services at a fee that is fair, cost recovery, uh, and, and, and done with supervision. But so the, but the issue this there is, is we can continue The issue doing. there is that it's used up. You've used up. You've built up Mississauga. You, you, you've used up the serving, servicing capacity. When it's time to build this in Brampton, that's when you're, you're running away on the bill. It's like ordering dinner, eating your, your, your meal, and then running away. And so, you know, Steve, my, my issue is um, the infrastructure that Alvin's talking about, and I wish Mayor Crombie would, would be here to speak to it, but the, the infrastructure that he's talking about is in Mississauga. We built the two water treatment plants in Mississauga. The police headquarters is in Mississauga. The infrastructure that Mississauga has paid 60% of that's in Brampton are archives we no longer need. Um, the Peel Regional Council chambers we no longer need. That is um, useless infrastructure that no, can be Mayor sold Brown, off. No, Mayor that's not fair. I mean, the we're also paying for roads. We're also paying for all the services for the last 50 <laughs> years. And this is going to continue to happen. We're going to do this are, in a, roads are in, in a service agreement, right? The council chambers are no longer necessary. No one is out to gouge anyone else. And no one's out to leave the taxpayer on the hook here for Brampton or Mississauga or Caledon. Can I just ask you, did you pay in any of this stuff? Yes, we paid 5%. Yeah. We, 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 we did pay 5%, yeah. and as again, again, we are the smaller of the three municipalities, but we did pay our share. And really, when we looked at this, the last time we looked at this, we determined that when we look at Brampton and Mississauga, the services that they use in social services, Caledon doesn't need that. Caledon does not use that much in the social services cost. Now, we do have regional roads that we have in Caledon. We've got 12 regional roads, but it was basically a wash. It was a wash because more social services are used in Brampton and Mississauga as opposed to Caledon. So at that point in time, when we looked at the whole regional governance issue and whether or not we should stay the way we are, um, and we, we determined that it was uh, best to stay the way we are. I'm so sure you guys have all done polling on this stuff. Yes. Uh, we got a little bit of polling here, too. Um, in 2019, when the province was reviewing the region, there was some polling done on what people think by Main Street research. In Mississauga, almost half the people supported separation. About a third wanted to stick with the region. 18% supported a new super city of Peel. 
In Brampton, about two-thirds wanted things left the way it is, with the region of Peel. Only 8% wanted to separate, and 25% wanted a super city of Peel to amalgamate. In Caledon, 64% preferred the status quo, 20% wanted to separate, and 17% supported amalgamation. And across the region, only 30% of those surveyed supported dissolution, while half want to keep the region, and 21% wanted a super city of Peel. Premier Ford said earlier this week, for the first time, he went on the record and said he has always been in favor of Mississauga having the right to stand on its own two feet and have its own way. Uh, I didn't know that. That was Did that come as news to you, incidentally? Because I don't think he said that publicly before. So, you know, he has said before that cities as large as Brampton and Mississauga could stand on their own feet. But in the same press conference he had last week in Brampton, he said um, that uh, the cost associated with this that would not would not be left on Brampton's doorstep, and and that's a very important principle. He promised to make you whole, I think, is the way he said it. Otherwise, it's yeah. it's it's theft from Brampton residents. We have paid into those that infrastructure for over 50 years. Now you've been campaigning, not you personally, but your city has been campaigning for to become the independent republic of Mississauga <laughs> for since 2005. Yeah, I was going to say it's 20 yeah. years, yeah. and yet half the people are only only half the people are on side. Are you sure that you are doing what you're? ratepayers want you to do. Absolutely. Uh, in 2005, when then Mayor McCallion took this to uh, city residents, um, there was a campaign. It came back 99% in support from residents, sent the city the message that they want to separate and that mm -hmm. this would be better for Mississauga residents because the numbers add up that Mississauga residents have been over-contributing to the region and have been subsidizing the other cities. And when you talk about a police model where we're losing or paying more uh, than our fair share, but that's, that's where a lot of the savings yeah. comes in for the city mm -hmm. of Mississauga. But to the right. mayor's point, the province is talking about making everybody whole to make sure that no one is going to but be left out. On I, I want to speak to the police point because Mayor Crombie um, brought up some magical figures she picked out of thin air the we other should day. Say, she was invited to be here yeah. today. Her schedule wouldn't but, permit. But I, I understand why she wouldn't want to delve into these facts. Facts get in the way with the uh, um, messaging sometime. Chief Nish has put on the Peel Region website the calls for service. Um, there is no... Mississauga subsidy of Brampton. There's more calls on a per capita basis in Mississauga. There's more auto thefts on a per capita basis in Mississauga. There is no subsidy. That's on the Peel Region Police website. It's on a, right now the funding allocations on a per capita basis. Um, so when you pick up a figure, and it may sound good, it's important that it's rooted in facts, and that's an example of a, of a statistics that's been used by your mayor that is factually incorrect. It's, it's demonstrably apparent that uh, a better educated officer does better in the field, leads to more positive uh, public uh, police citizen interactions. And it's been particularly um, questionable over the years that such an important aspect of our society, policing, where there's so much controversy, there, you know, bad interactions have massive repercussions, that it's one of the few uh, professions where we don't require a university-specific degree program. Uh, when you think of other professions, nursing, teaching, architecture, accounting, social work, dentistry, engineering, law, medicine, I could probably think of more. Timothy might have some others on his list as well. Uh, I just think that this is a natural progression as we evolve as a society and as the role of policing in society expands exponentially. Policing is now in the social work field, in the psychiatry field. We talk about de-escalating people in mental health crisis, uh, dealing with people that are suffering from substance uh, dependency. And, and so the job has gotten much more complex than when I started walking the beat in 1985 in Vanier, where that was a very simple mandate, to now a mandate that spans all kinds of different uh, areas and requiring further education that's not delivered at the Ontario Police College or in field training. Timothy, what about it? Is there an argument to be made that the requirement of a post-secondary degree could constitute a barrier to getting more people into a police service somewhere? I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's a barrier. Um, and 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 to be, I mean, to be fair and to be clear is that many police services have already moved to require some level of post-secondary education as a minimum requirement for consideration of applications in their service. So that standard in, in many ways is already the case formally in some police services or informally in the hiring process. So those candidates that come, that, that apply to police services, that 
only require a high school education. Those candidates that have higher levels of formal education fare much better in the hiring process already. So it seems to me that police services see a value in post-secondary education because they are already prioritizing post-secondary education when they're making hiring decisions. If there is, in fact, a concern about barriers, perhaps the solution there is to increase access to post-secondary education. Because that? that would, in fact, eliminate some of the barriers if those are the concerns. Let me put that to Mark. What, what about the idea of if post-secondary is a barrier, knock down the barrier to post-secondary? Well, yeah, you know, that's certainly one solution. I think right now, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police recently said that 10% of recruits at the police college don't have post-secondary education. So we're not talking about a large group of individuals that are becoming police officers that uh, that don't have post-secondary education. And, and I don't know what makeup of the 10% are, but I would, um, you know, anecdotally, I, I, from my experience, I would say that, you know, those are most likely people who have been in the workforce, perhaps been in the trades, maybe been in the military, who have gained life experience and then now uh, have shifted their focus to policing. Uh, can I, can yeah. I ask you a personal question? Yeah. Have you got a post-secondary degree? I, I have a diploma for, I have a two-year diploma from Fanshawe. Okay, that's a post-secondary, okay, diploma. Yes. Do you think it has been useful to your being a better cop? Honestly, I, I don't, I think that the train, no, I think the training that we receive, I think it's helpful. I think it helped me in the early stages, uh, at, certainly at the police college, but at the, you know, it's a very intensive training program that, and highly regulated um, that you go through at the Ontario Police College. It's now up to 13 or 14 weeks. Plus you have regular yearly training uh, as well, as well as ongoing training um, with whatever the latest uh, that's happening in policing is. And so, you know, I think, you know, in policing, we really are constantly uh, educating our police officers and you know it's a lifelong learn learning profession where you're you're always learning um, the latest updates and the latest training on trends or what, what's happening um, in policing. As an example, <clears throat> the opioid pandemic, which we know is so tragically killing so many people uh, across this country on our streets. Um, when I went to police college in 2005, we weren't learning about. Uh, opioids or drug overdose deaths because it wasn't something that we were dealing with. It's something that evolved over time and as that issue came to the forefront, we trained our police officers on how to respond to those types So they of are getting training on that now? Certainly. I want to go to Timothy on that. How good would you say the current way we train police officers rolls out? Well, I think to assume that the education that's provided uh, at the Ontario Police Co uh, College or in-service training, uh, as, as good as it may be, is sufficient to address the kinds of complex public safety concerns that are facing many, you know, communities in Ontario. I think it's 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 perhaps a little naive. Um, what we know is that police training over the last decade has had to be revamped because it has been you know, proven to be ineffective at responding to certain kinds of incidents. Um, we know that the kinds of um, uh, communities and the kinds of uh, places in which policing is taking place, it, it, not just individuals who struggle with mental health or addiction issues or people in crisis, but individuals with language barriers, individuals who may have who, who may have come to to this to to to. To, to reside in Ontario from a vast, um, you know, array of, of, of backgrounds. What you get in a, I think, in a post-secondary uh, education is the kinds of really meaningful and important transferable skills that allow you to do those, you know, multiple angles of that job, whether it's communication, understanding, analysis, problem solving, understanding what you don't understand, right? And you can then take those skills and use them to learn and, and, and continue your development as, as a police officer. And, and I think the point also has to be made here is that having a post-secondary education, have a, having higher levels of formal education is an asset to police officers, period, to their own career development, to their own progression. And so what I think here, again, that is most concerning is to have this debate about whether a post-secondary education is valuable or not is really, you know, the wrong discussion to be having. The question is, how do we equip police officers with the kinds of skills that they need to effectively meet the public safety challenges community space? 
Well, let me just begin by asserting a, a, my own personal stake in this. Unlike uh, your other guests, I, I don't have a personal connection to life in Mexico. But I was present at the beginning of the transition to multi-party democracy. In the elections of 2000 in Mexico, for the, uh, power transitioned from a president of one party to a president of another party by means of a free and fair, peaceful election, something that had never before happened in the nearly 200-year history of the Mexican state. Um, that a miraculous, breathtaking event was honored by a visit to the White House by the incoming president, Vicente Fox, um, in the, the fall of uh, 2001. And uh, I, I remember seeing him on the south lawn of the White House. I was working there at the time and being in a big crowd of well-wishers and excited people. And th this was part of the global democratic transformation that we so admired in those days. But this one was especially intimate because it was so close at hand. And Mexico has, is a country that has has so has has so many opportunities, but has had such struggles in the year 2000 and 2001. It really seemed like a page had been turned, and Mexico was going to on, on its way to catch up to the developed world. If the Mexican economy had grown from the time Me Mexico entered NAFTA in the middle 1990s until now, at even ha uh, a quarter of the speed of the Chinese economy over those years, Mexico would now be looking looking very like a country in Southern Europe. That level of development, and that's the heartbreaking thing. What are we afraid of now in Mexico? When you talk about the subversion of democracy, it may conjure up the idea of some kind of authoritarian dictatorship. That's uh, not really the thing to worry about the most. The, the thing to worry about the most is that in his attempt to snuff out democratic institutions, the current president, Lopez Obrador, is going to weaken even further the already weak Mexican state and lose power to criminal organizations. Mexico, Mexico suffers, has always suffered from a weak state, a state that can't make its authority run, that can't protect people, that can't collect taxes. Um, democracy is a huge asset for a state. It gives the state legitimacy. It answers the question, well, why should I pay your taxes? Well, you voted for it. That's why you should pay the taxes. Um, if Lopez Obrador continues to do unto Mexico what he's been doing, you could see not a return to the kind of heavy-handed authoritarianism of the past, but to a breakdown of authority that opens the way to all kinds of criminal elements who already um, are so present in so many areas of Mexico's territory. But Lorena, just a quick follow-up. Nobody's concerned that he's going to change the law and allow himself to run for another term. Are people concerned about that? He is not seeking re-election. Hmm. What he has done, as, as David has said, he's been dismantling a lot of counterweight powers. Um, the autonomous institutions that used to regulate the energy sector, the telecom sector. Um, Lopez Obrador is a president who does not like limits. He does not like external limits. He does not like oversight. He does not tolerate criticism. Um, and even from the press, like he has been systematically attacking the press. Since he controlled Congress for the first half term, uh, the first half of his term, then he was very happy with the way he was passing laws. Um, he lost the constitutional majority after the midterm elections, and this put him in a different mindset. So what he has tried to do right now is completely dismantle the National Electoral Institute, which was the safeguard of our democracy. This institution um, was approved by the majority of the population. It has run elections freely and fairly. It has supervised elections. These elections are conducted by the citizens. And it has even managed to succeed in conducting elections in states that have been plagued by, uh, by, by, by organized crime, like Tamaulipas. So it has been a very successful um, element of democracy. But Lorraine, um, let me jump he... in on that for a second, because I know that uh, I mean, you're a pollster, so you will appreciate this. Morning Consult, which is a poll, an organization that did polling around the world, they polled 22 countries. He's the third most popular leader in the world, behind only Modi of India and Berset of Switzerland. I mean, he's, he's over 60 percent. Uh, Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau would give their eye teeth for those kinds of numbers. What makes him so popular? But in Mexico, we have to look at our history. In Mexico, most presidents are popular. Since 2000, which is what we consider a democratic period since Vicente Fox, even since 1994 with, with Cedillo, where we had our first divided government, et cetera, 
Uh, most presidents have been around high 50s, low 60s. The only exception was Enrique Peña Nieto, the president who was for, uh, former to, to López Obrador. So in Mexico, we have to put those numbers in context. That does not mean that he has a blank check to do whatever he wants. And that's why we have seen a lot of opposition. We saw him uh, have a very important electoral defeat in 2021, not only in the congressional elections, but in specific cities and in Mexico City and in the state of Mexico. So we have to, we have to put that in perspective. For advanced democracies, for industrial democracies, these are high numbers. In Mexico, and generally, presidents are well liked. We are very lenient with our presidents, and we don't have re-election. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily turn into electoral numbers. Um, Ernesto Cedillo, who had high approval ratings, had to turn over power to Vicente Fox, which was from a different party, and Felipe Calderón had to do the same. Like he turned over to the PRI. So we have to put that in context. Understood. Gustavo, can he, can he say that he has improved the lives of the average Mexican citizen? Well, it, had, it, it really depends on the, which dimension we're talking about. Uh, you know, um, David mentioned earlier some of the challenges that Mexico faces, and I think uh, he's correct in pointing these out. But, uh, but it's also worth, as, as Lorena mentioned, uh, taking a longer view. And many of these challenges have been around much before López Obrador, right? Some of them, the issue of, of crime or immigration or, or um, you know, the, the trade relationship with the U.S., these are challenges that are uh, ongoing. And uh, some of them become more or less salient, depending on the, on the presidential period. Um, I think it's safe to say that there are there are important sectors of the population that truly believe that there has been an improvement in the way things uh, are going. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, May 19th, 2023. Monday, it's Victoria Day, and we'll give way for the TVO original slow documentary, Tripping Train 185, which captures Northern Ontario and the route from Sudbury to White River as you've never seen it before. We'll be back Tuesday with a conversation about laneway houses in Ontario and whether they can really help with the affordable housing crisis. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great long weekend and Steve will see you on Tuesday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.